Hi everybody, my name is Pastor Dave Myers. I'm the lead pastor here at Royal Oak Victory Church. And thanks for joining in on the message today. My prayer is that it'll strengthen your faith, encourage your heart, and speak something powerful into your life. If it turns out to be a blessing, would you please consider sharing it with someone else as one of our passions here at ROVC is to get the word out to as many people as possible. And so without further ado, let's jump right into today's message. When I face a challenge or a tough time, I find joy in the Lord. As Psalm 91 says, He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. Late 2018, my best friend Kevin diagnosed with myeloma cancer. We committed to God that we would spend an hour first thing in the morning every day talking to Him. We did this for the whole year of 2019, regardless if it was sunny or stormy weather. We walked every day, shout out to God for help, and sang praises. March 2019, COVID hit us, and I started working from home like everyone else. Meanwhile, company went through management change, and several key personnel left and the project was on hold, causing a lot of fear and uncertainty. It was like hitting a wall and nothing moving forward. It was a tough time restructuring the team and preparing things for project restart. The original plan, I thought, was helping a friend to fight his illness. However, the Lord slowly transformed me and I would lift up my fear to Him and continue to receive His guidance and strength how to tackle my work challenge. After a year, the wall finally came down. The project restarted with a brand new team. As for my friend, Kevin, I witnessed one miracle after another, from no side effect on chemo treatment to complete stem cell transplant. God was there walking with us. My work is as tough as usual, but my joy remains since I know God was always there and He has a place for me. Yeah, let's give Arthur a big hand for that. Fantastic. And I really appreciate that testimony. A lot of good nuggets there uh, when it comes to the topic of joy. Um, you know, one of the, uh, the statements Arthur made that really spoke to me in that testimony uh, was uh, actually at the very beginning. It was where Arthur, actually, he quoted Psalm 91. Uh, he said, God alone is a refuge. Uh, he is our place of great safety. Uh, safety. Let's say that word together. Safety. And it's interesting to link joy with that word safety. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what I want to talk about uh, this morning. It reminds us yet again of um, uh, some of the awesome, wonderful things that can happen in our lives uh, whenever uh, we allow God's joy to work more deeply in us. And so those of you who've been with us for the past several Sundays now, you know we've been moving in a series on that. And when I say that, I mean on joy. Uh, we, uh, we've entitled this series, Find Joy, a study in the book of Philippians. Uh, that's where we've been for the last little while. We started out by talking about uh, what I call the seven habits of joy. And these are seven things. You can do one each day because there's seven days in a week. Uh, seven things you can do that will increase and enhance your measure of God's joy in your life. That was where we started. Then we went to what I called some lessons of joy and some of the things we can do to have what I called no matter what joy. No matter what joy, no matter what. And then those of you who were with us last Sunday, you'll know that Pastor Sheldon preached a uh, uh, awesome word on, uh, on the subject of the pathway of joy. Uh, what path ought we to take in life to find joy? And so that's where we've been so far in this series. And this morning what I want to do is move on and talk about uh, what I call joy, God's safe place. Joy, God's safe place. And, um, and we're going to look at uh, uh, just the benefits of living uh, more deeply, walking more deeply, living more closely to God's joy. And so if you have your Bibles with you, you can either turn them on or turn them to Philippians 3, um, verse 1. And uh, there's a very familiar portion of Scripture there. 
I would love to uh, teach on the whole chapter of Philippians 3, but I'm not going to be able to. There's just too much there. Uh, I actually got captured with just one verse, and so we're going to focus in on that one verse. I'm going to be reading out of the New King James Version. For those of you who have a Bible app, have access to a variety of versions. But so let, let's pick it up here in Philippians 3.1. It says, finally, my brethren, and how many know that includes cisterns too? Okay, so you ladies are included in that. Finally, my brother and my sister and rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is what? Safe. Safe. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious. For you, it is safe. And I don't know about you, but I find that this statement of Paul's here, I find it to be rather odd. I really do. And the reason why I say that is because of the way in which he chooses to describe uh, this thing called joy. He says that we are to rejoice in the Lord. He says, I'm writing to you again about this. Um, and the reason why I'm writing it is because it is a safe thing to do. It is safe. It is safe. And really, when you think about uh, the whole topic of joy, there are a whole lot of other words Paul could have used uh, to describe it. He could have said, for instance, rejoice in the Lord for me to write to you, this to you is not tedious, but it's wise. He could have used the word wise. He could have said rejoice in the Lord for me to write this to you is important. He could have said that, or prudent, or essential. Uh, he could have said it's a really, really, really good idea, but what I find interesting is that when Paul chose to speak of the subject of joy, he purposely uses the word safe. Safe. One translation says it like this, rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same things to you is a safeguard. Another one says, I'm writing this again for your safety. And yet another one says, I write again so that you will be far safer, far safer. And you know what it tells me is that to Paul, a life characterized by joy and rejoicing uh, was not just a nice idea. It wasn't just a good suggestion. It wasn't even wise or a sensible thing to do. But rather to Paul, joy was a place of great safety. Joy was a place of security. Joy is a fortress, a stronghold that is able to protect and shield us from many of the painful and trying things that uh, we tend to face in life. How many here have ever been through a painful and trying time? One person. How many? Okay. There's a few of us. Uh, we go through painful and trying things in life. In fact, you might be here this morning and you say, wow, my whole week, Pastor, my whole month, my whole life has been that way. Painful and trying. And, you know, one thing we need to realize is that joy actually protects us from pain. And um, it is God's safe place. I find that interesting. You know, it was in 1953 that a medical doctor by the name of Jonas Salk created a vaccine that over time would prove 100% effective in the treatment of the disease known as polio. And prior to that discovery, polio epidemics would be found all over the world, maiming, crippling hundreds of thousands of people. But you know, Salk's vaccine was so effective that within a mere 15 years, Polio was almost completely eradicated off the face of the earth. And um, what it tells us is the power vaccines have when it comes to treating disease. Now, the reason why I mention that is because I'm not going to try and convince you to take the COVID vaccine, okay? We're not going there this morning. Um, we're staying on track, amen. How many are tracking with me? The reason why I mention that is because in many ways, that's how God's joy works in our lives. Uh, that joy is what you might call heaven's vaccine. Joy is what I call God's great cure that protects and guards us from many of the difficulties and hardships we face in life. That is the power and the healing properties that are found in joy. Joy is God's safe place. 
And you know, David said that very thing in Psalm 32, 7. He says, God, you are my hiding place. He says, you protect me from trouble. Well, how does he do that? Well, he explains how in the very last part of the verse, you surround me with joyous songs of salvation. In other words, what David has learned was that joy and rejoicing and celebration and singing were not just a great idea. It wasn't just a mood lifter. David had learned that joy and rejoicing was actually a stronghold, a safe place that would keep him from many the difficulties and trying things that he would face in life. And you know, it's no different with us. Joy works in the same way. It keeps us, it guards us, it protects us. And you know, this morning what I want to do is I want to share with you some of the ways that actually happens, some practical ways the keeping, restoring power of joy works in us. And so how many here are ready to learn some new things this morning? You're awake, you're ready. Turn to the person next to you and say, God has a cure for you. Cure for you. If you're watching online, you can put it in the feed. God has a cure for me. And of course, that cure is joy. And so one of the first things joy does in our lives is joy is an ointment um, that heals me. There's healing properties in this thing called joy. And you know, it was just this week, I was reading some of the most recent statistics when it comes to the, uh, the negative effects anxiety and pressure, depression have in our lives. Very negative. And uh, in fact, in Canada, it is estimated that 51 billion, how many know that's a lot of money, $51 billion a year goes into treating anxiety, depression, mental illness. And that doesn't just include health care costs, but also in that figure, our loss of work, productivity, the quality of life for the people who suffer with it, $51 billion. That's a high cost. The World Psychiatric Association says that people with depression and mental illness experience a reduction of life expectancy by as much as 10 to 20 percent. And that means there are far more to, to die prematurely, people who struggle in that area. At the Mayo Clinic, at the Harvard Medical Center, it says that depression can lower, it actually can lower a person's immunity and make them far more susceptible to illness. Illnesses all the way from the common cold to heart disease and stroke. That, my friends, is the incredibly high cost anxiety and depression has on society. And that's why the ointment of God's joy is so valuable in our lives. Joy has a way of breaking some of those things. Joy has a way of healing some of those things. Joy has a way of soothing us in our, in our difficult times, our, 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 our horrific times of life, our discouraging times, and, and, and restore us back to a state of wholeness again. And you know, the Bible talks about this in quite a few places. One of my favorite verses is in Proverbs 17.22. It says, a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drives up the bones. One translation says it like this, a happy heart is a good medicine and a cheerful mind works healing. Right? A heart that's happy, a heart that's full of joy. It's like medicine. It, it, it produces healing in our lives. That's the properties, some of the key properties that are, are found in joy. And you know, the medical profession has known this for years. In fact, recent studies were done at the uh, medicine school, school of medicine in the University of Maryland. They said that, uh, that laughter, just to laugh, just to be able to laugh, not only enhances your mood, lifts it higher, but it also strengthens and protects your heart. Uh, Dr. Patrick Flanagan says that laughter is a form of internal jogging. And when I read that, I liked that because I Internal jogging uh, compared to external. <laughs> How many are with me on that one? Yeah, I'd rather laugh internally than externally. I was driving around yesterday. I actually saw people outside yesterday jogging. 
in the snow and sleet, and um, I prayed for them. <laughs> and then I did some internal But um, it says that it stimulates the brain. It, it releases beneficial hormones, endorphins. And it says that a good laugh every day is extremely good for our health. It's good for our health. Uh, he also goes on to say that adults last, laugh approximately 15 times per day, and children laugh about 400 times per day. Uh-oh. Uh, which tells me that somewhere along the line, as we uh, set on the journey of growing up, we lost uh, several hundred laughs a day. A day, 300, more than 300 laughs a day. And, um, and some of us need to get our laughs back. We need to get our joy back because there's, it shows us the healing qualities joy has in our lives. That there's just something about joy and rejoicing that can restore us like nothing else can. And that's why we need to do whatever's possible to stay in joy. To stay out of depression and fear and bitterness and offense and anger and step back into joy. Now, I do know that there are different kinds of depression. Uh, some depression is situational. You're depressed because what's going on around you. Uh, that's a kind of depression that's easier to step out of, right? It's a choice. I choose joy. Joy no matter what. But then, of course, there's clinical depression, and that's totally different. I mean, that's when it's good to see a specialist, see a doctor, and, um, and it has to do with medication and stuff like that. So we don't want to get that mixed up. But I do want to say that to live in depression and anger and fear and bitterness and offense situationally is not the will of God for our lives because it has detrimental effects on our health and well-being. Joy is where... We are the healthiest. And so that's the first thing I see here about joy. It's an ointment that heals me. You know, the second thing is joy is a force that strengthens me. And, you know, there's just something about God's joy. I don't know what it is that has a way of energizing and re reinforcing us like nothing else can. And I know it's sure true of me um, because there are some days, and I think all of us have days like this, you know, some days when we feel so tired, right? Some days when we feel completely spent. Some days when it seems like there's not one ounce of life left in me to give. How many have ever had a day like that? Yeah, I mean, we just, we just don't have anything left to give. And yet I find when I face a day like that, a depleting, exhausting day, I find that if I can just get back into joy, Right back into rejoicing, back into thanksgiving and gratitude, that a fresh wave of God's strength is poured back in me again. That is the lifting, lifting, strengthening effect joy has upon us. And you know, the Bible says that very thing uh, in the book of Nehemiah. It says, for the joy of the Lord is our what? Is our strength. It's our strength. We find strength and joy. You know, the interesting thing about this word, strength, it's an Old Testament word, but it literally means a refuge, a stronghold, a place of protection. It's interesting that this word here that Nehemiah wrote down thousands of years ago is exactly the same thing Paul was saying in Philippians 3, 1, that joy is our place of refuge, the healthiest, safest place we can ever find ourselves in. And so what that tells me is that whenever we get out of joy, whenever we step out of joy, whenever we get out of gratitude and thanksgiving and surrender and rest, we literally open ourselves up to a flood tide of danger and attack. And of course, the devil, he knows that. And that's why he works overtime trying to steal our joy. And so I want to ask you this morning, just how is your joy tank doing? How is the needle on your joy gauge 
where is it located? I know a lot of people through the pandemic have lost their joy. Uh, some of them lost their joy in sadness. Some have lost their, their, their joy in grief. Some people lost their joy because they just got mad and offended. They lost their joy. And I'll tell you, if, if, if the devil who, 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 who walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, I'm telling you, if he can trick you into stealing your joy, he has the potential to take every other precious and valuable thing from you. Amen? And that's why I want to encourage you that regardless of what you might be going through, Regardless of what you might see on the news every night or on your news feed, regardless of what people have said or done to you, that you do everything you can to stay in joy because that's where the greatest amount of strength and resilience is found. How many of you know the Christian walk is not a hair race, right? It's not the fastest who gets there. The Christian walk is, 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 is one through sheer persistence and tenacity. We grow weary in our well-doing. And one of the key ways that we fend off weariness and fatigue in our lives is stepping back and drinking more deeply of God's joy. You know, I love what the writer Habakkuk, the prophet Habakkuk, had to say about this. He said, even though the fig trees have no blossom, there's no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crops fail, the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty. What are we talking about? This is an all-out economic holocaust. You talk about a bad day, this is a bad day times a million. No figs, no fruit, no olives, no flocks in the field. The cattle are, are not found in the barn. This is a dark day. This is a day of, of, of hopelessness and despair. And yet look at what Habakkuk says. In the very next verse, he says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. You know what that's called? Choosing joy in a dark place. He, he says it's dark. It's darker than it's ever been. I don't know what the future is going to be like. I don't know how it's all going to pan out. It's dark and getting darker, but Habakkuk makes the choice to choose joy in the dark place and look at the outcome of it in the very next verse. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a Deer able to tread upon the heights. How many know that verse is describing someone who's strong? That God, our sovereign Lord, the God who created the heavens and the earth, when we choose to stay in joy in the dark place, he literally comes down and he strengthens it. He's our strength and he's able to make me sure-footed as a deer. One translation says, I run like a deer. I feel like I'm king of the mountain. Amen. And uh, that's the lifting, strengthening, energizing effects jo God's joy has in our lives. And so if you are weary this morning, whether in person, online, one way to break the weariness is to step back into joy. Joy, joy is, 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 is a force that strengthens us. You know, another thing joy is, is joy is a compass that guides me. And, you know, inscribed right in the text of the United States Declaration of Independence are these words right here. That we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain un... un, un I know. I even had that spaced out, and I said it five times right this morning. But anyway, you got it right, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? These are without a doubt some of the most powerful words that have ever been written. In fact, so powerful that one of the greatest nations on the face of the earth is founded on these words. 
And you know, the, the, as powerful as there are, there is one part of this declaration that I have some trouble with. And that is the statement at the very end, the part that says that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? Happiness. Happiness. I do have some trouble with that statement. The reason why I say that is because God has never called us to engage in an endless, lifelong pursuit of happiness. He never has. That happiness should never be our goal in life. And the reason why I say that is because happiness is so fickled and elusive. It's a very hard thing to find. One minute it's here, the next minute it's gone. How many know what I'm talking about? One minute you find it, then the next minute you lose it. It's one of the most fickle, elusive qualities here on earth. Some people say, man, if I could just buy that brand new car, the one I've been dreaming about. You know, the one with all the bells and the whistles, all the new features. Man, if I could just get that car, then I would be happy. Really, truly happy. And yet, you know what it's like? The day finally comes when we buy it, and whether it's six or eight or 12 months uh, uh, driving it off the lot, we stop at a red light and we look at the car parked next to us. Six, eight, 12 months after buying it, and we begin to compare ours to theirs. We begin to realize they have more bells and whistles than I have. They have even newer features than I have. Their car is nicer than my car. And it seems like the elusive bird of happiness that we once felt we held on so tightly to just flies right out the window. Amen? Or what about this one? We are dating the guy, the girl of our dreams. Some of you know where I'm going with this one. We say to ourselves, man, if I could just marry them, then I really, really would be happy. That would make me so happy. And yet, you know what it's like, whether it's six or eight or 12 months after the honeymoon? Guys, you wake up one morning, she has curlers in her hair, this chalky white cream all over her face. And you say, where, where is that beautiful princess I married and, and I can't find her anywhere, the one I fell in love with? I don't think I'm happy anymore. It's kind of quiet in here. Of course, for you ladies, you've been up all night because your dream man's been snoring like a freight train all night long. And now he's up, his breath is so bad it could stop a charging grizzly bear dead in its tracks. And she says, where's that handsome Prince Charming I married? Sometime through the night, he turned back into a frog. What happened? Where is my prince that I fell in love with? Why, I don't think I'm very happy anymore. Amen. And that's why our compass in life should never be set on the reckless pursuit of happiness, not happiness. Because it's only following by following God's joy that we can ever expect to be brought into the far greater, more fulfilling things God has for us. It's only by setting joy as our compass. There's a big difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is based on happenstance. Happiness is based on circumstance. It's, it's, it's based on situational things that are going on around us. That's why it's so fleeting and elusive. Joy, on the other hand, is based in the character of God that never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He loves me as much now, today, as he ever will. I am a precious daughter. I'm a precious son in his sight. And just those two thoughts alone will bring joy back into our heart. And that's why we want to set our compass on joy. I love what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12 too, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In other words, he's our model. He's our guide. What did he do? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
And what this verse is telling us is that Jesus was able to press through the pain. What pain? The pain, the agony, the horror of the cross. All the shame that was attached to that. And the way he was able to do that, this is what this verse says, is because he made joy, not happiness, his compass. It says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. That's how he was able to get through life and endure is he set joy as his guidepost. And it's no different with us. That as we learn to make joy our compass, we will be far better positioned at both finding and walking in the will and purposes God has for us. And so rather than saying to yourself things like this, what can I do, where can I go that I will make me more happy, where I can find more happiness, rather than saying things like that, it would be far better to say, what can I do, where can I go that will produce more of God's deep joy and rejoicing in my life. Where is the path that that leads me on? You know, Pastor Sheldon actually talked about that last Sunday. Uh, he said that we can take the road that the Romans called the honor course. That's what they called it, the honor course. A path that led them upward. It went from pride to honor to self-gratification. This is out of Philippians chapter 2. We can take that road or we can follow the path that Jesus took. And that is the path that led downward to humility, servanthood, and sacrifice. And I'll tell you right now, that second one right there, the, the path that leads us into deeper expressions of, of, of humility and servanthood and sacrifice, that is the path to joy, to joy. You find joy in that path. And that's why we always want to be asking ourselves the question, what am I seeking and running after in life? And I want you to think about that. What are we looking for? What are my priorities and values? Because if it's the elusive pursuit of happiness and pleasure and fun, we will be let down every single time. But if it's the force of God's joy and his co contentment based on our obedience to him, our commitment to him, our devotion to him. I'm going to set my heart's compass on joy. I'll tell you, that pursuit will take us in God's will each and every time. And so joy is an ointment that heals me. Joy is a force that strengthens me. Joy is a compass that guides me. And then lastly this morning, uh, joy is a weapon that protects me. And you know, we've talked a lot about this one. Um, the liberating, freeing power that's found in joy. We've talked a lot about it. Uh, we saw it in the story of King Jehoshaphat, right? When he was surrounded by a coalition of enemy armies. He called a, a mass multitude against them. And they began to pray and fast. And God gave the marching orders. Look, King, when, I want you to march out against them, but I want you to do it differently. I want you to put the music before the muscles and the singing before the soldiers and the harps before the hand grenades. In other words, I want you to go out in joy. I want you to go out rejoicing. And that's exactly what they did. The Bible says they went out singing for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And the power of God landed in that place and, and the enemy army was completely defeated. It's the power, protective power. It's called the weapon of joy. We sang about it this morning. You saw the very same thing with Paul and Silas thrown in prison. They were in, in, in stocks in the inner prison. And so back in those days, in Roman days, there was the, 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 the normal part of the prison, then the inner prison. They were in the inner prison in stocks. And the Bible says at midnight, they began singing praises to God permeating the dark place. At the darkest time, it was a dark place. At the darkest time, it was midnight. They permeated it not with complaining, not with protesting. They permeated the dark place. They were singing hymns to God. We all, many of us know the story, and the presence of God showed up, and the whole prison began to shake. 
And it says that all the prison doors were opened and the prisoners, Paul and Silas were set free, so were everyone else. That's the power of joy. The power of joy. That's the weapon of joy. And you know, the psalmist talks about that in Psalm 149, verse 6. It says, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. It's kind of a neat verse. What I find interesting about this verse is that the writer directly links joy and rejoicing, think about it, joy and rejoicing with combat and warfare. It says, let the high praises of God be in our mouth. That's joy. And then he says, and a two-edged sword in our hand, that is combat and warfare. And you know, I don't completely understand it. I don't completely understand get it but but the fact is is there's just something about giving praise expressing joy and thanksgiving in our lives that has a way of increasing God's presence and his anointing and and, and so that he can come and break the strongholds that have been set up around us there's just something about it amen And that's why I call joy the atomic bomb of the spirit. When we walk in it, some some things get broken. Some demonic things get broken. When it's declared and, and released in our lives, it has the ability to break and crush many of the things that are seeking to weaken and take us out. And so this morning, I want you to think about what some of those things might be in your life right now. What are some of those things? Maybe it's a spirit of anxiety and fear that has gotten hold of you and won't let you go. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe, maybe it's a root of anger and offense that has been slowly growing bigger and bigger in your heart. Maybe it's a wound or hurt that you've received that never seems to go away, even though you've done everything to try and get free of it. Maybe it's a spirit of weariness and fatigue that has begun to drain you and sap you and take all of your strength and motivation. Whatever it might be, you know, God is saying his... His words to us this morning, and I want you to hear me, is that God is saying, I want to come and free you. That's God's promise to us. That's what he wants to do. I want to come and heal you. I want to come and break all the things that are seeking to torment and weaken and limit your life. God says, I want to come and do that in you. That's my gift to you. That's what I have for you. There is no darkness in heaven. There is no depression in heaven. Uh, Heaven is saturated uh, with a culture, an expression of joy. And that very atmosphere of heaven, God is saying, I want to bring down in your life, even this week, even this day, I want to bring in my atmosphere of joy, seeping it into your life so that you can find the liberty and freedom and healing that you need to take the next step that I've called you to. Amen? Just listen to what the prophet Isaiah says, very familiar portion of scripture. It's actually one that Jesus quoted in the New Testament. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance for our God, to comfort all who mourn. And then look at this. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them, this is so beautiful, beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. How many know that's exactly what Jesus came to do? 
I call it the great exchange. Jesus taking all our ashes and brokenness and replacing it with his beauty and grace. Jesus removing our weaknesses and heaviness and exchanging it with a garment of rejoicing and praise. Jesus lifting our sadness and mourning and filling us with fresh, restorative, healing power by his unstoppable, inexhaustible presence of joy in our lives. That is the gift that God has for us today, a wonderful gift of fresh joy for us. Amen? so that we can be healed and strengthened, guided and protected. And so this morning, uh, we're gonna have um, a therapy session. We still got time for one of those, don't we? Some of you are nervous. You're saying, I thought that was tomorrow night. And I do wanna encourage you, come tomorrow night for the workshop. It's gonna be powerful. But when I say therapy, I'm talking about I'm talking about a beautiful, I'm talking about the power of praise, the power of music. How many know that God's anointing flows on the the, the wings of music? You know, there's a story in the Bible about how King Saul got got, got tormented by an evil spirit. and, And the only way that spirit would leave is when David played his harp. The spirit left. And you know, we're gonna have um, a special Uh, right now, and um, uh, Jeff is going to play on on our piano, and Ebby's going to come and sing uh, one of my favorite hymns, and you know, as, as as they minister, I want you to receive the healing power of God this morning. It's, it, it'll be laid in, in the music they sing, and just receive it as a gift for yourself, amen? Amen.
Amen. Well, how many appreciated that? Amen. I want us to stand. That's what I call joy therapy. Amen. Just knowing that regardless of what we go through in life, God is there. And he's done everything that needs to be done to carry us through. And that we ought not to weary, get weary or tired in well-doing, that he's going to lift us. He's going to heal us. He's going to strengthen us. He's going to protect us. And he does it all through his own impartation of joy. So, Father, we thank you for that. And, Lord, right now we pray that you would fill us all with a fresh impartation of your supernatural joy. And I want you to receive that right now in Jesus' name, just a fresh infilling of joy in your life. And, Father, I break every spirit of heaviness. Father, I come against all worry and anxiety. Father, where there is liberty, Father, there is your work. Your kingdom is manifested. Father, where liberty is found. And so, Lord, we thank you. We receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have we had a good time this morning? Amen. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching the message today, and I hope that it lifted and encouraged you in some way. If you made a decision to follow Christ today, we would love to know about it. And the best way to do that, to let us know, is by heading over to our website at rovc.ca and clicking on the tab that says connect with us. Also, if this message was a blessing to you, we'd love it if you could get the word out by liking and subscribing or even giving to our ministry. If you're interested in making a donation, you can do so by heading again to our website and clicking on the Give tab. Again, thanks for joining us, and may God richly bless you.